On today's show, the Houston Rockets could not replicate their success against the Utah Jazz, dropping the game in Salt Lake City 109 to 101. This was an ugly, ugly game for three quarter. Even even the fourth quarter was was pretty ugly. All things honest, uh, the silver lining, couple silver linings, if that. Kevin Porter Jr., after a really rough three quarters, turned it on in the fourth and almost carried the Rockets to a win. Jalen Green's defense throughout the game was actually pretty impressive, and there were a couple other positives, few and far between, from this game. We're going to break it all down for you right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. You get in somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as Rockets Watch. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, where you can help the show out tremendously by commenting on the videos. Today's question of the day. What is wrong with the Houston Rockets offense? Why does it look so dang bad? Let me know in the YouTube comments. I do read each and every one of those every single day. Today, we're going to talk about this really ugly Rockets Jazz game. Part two of Rockets Jazz, and it did not look pretty. This was a bad game. Uh, Like, look, I was on the upswing. I was feeling better going into tip-off of this game. Like, I've been dealing with this, you know, sinus, cold stuff, whatever, for the last few years. This game made me sicker. Like, this was the type of game that makes me want to start doing draft coverage in October. That's how bad this game was. There was no joy in this game through the first three quarters. There was, like, maybe a teensy tiny bit of joy watching Gary Bird, like, actually splash a couple threes. And even that is kind of like, well, like, they're bad shots. They're contested coming off curls. Like, they're going in, but they're not good shots. And that, that to me, is almost the perfect encapsulation of the Rockets' offense through five games this season is is more or less it's all right the shots are going in but they're not good shots um that's what it kind of feels like at times we're gonna talk about kpj his really rough overall game through three quarters and then turning it on in the fourth we'll talk about jalen green's uh impressive defense throughout this one and really kind of just this season jalen green feels like he's been a lot more locked in on ball defensively off ball he falls asleep at times uh, the, the Rockets defense was actually good enough to, to win this game, despite being just atrocious in transition. Their half court defense was good enough to win this game, holding the jazz to just 109 points is that's, that's a, that's a winnable, uh, point total. If you're the Rockets, if you didn't shoot yourself in the foot so much offensively with the turnovers, all that stuff. So let's start with just the game was just ugly. Like nobody, nobody here had a good game. I didn't even put out I didn't even put out the tweet about who do you want for the locked on Rockets player of the game. Begrudgingly, I will say KPJ because he managed to turn it on the fourth and and it still doesn't quite make up for how bad the rest of the game was through three quarters. Through three quarters, Kevin Porter Jr. was four of fourteen from the floor, 0 of four from three, one trip to the free throw line, hit the one trip, two rebounds, four assists, one steal, one block, and four turnovers. An ugly, ugly game. Along with everybody else on the roster. Nobody had a good game through through three quarters. Maybe you say Gary Bird had a good game, but e- even then, it's like, I said, those shots are, they're bad shots that he takes. So, nobody had a good game through three quarters. And then in the fourth, KPJ turned it on. The Rockets were down 14 going to the fourth quarter. They trailed by as many as 19 in this game. KPJ turned it on in the fourth quarter. And this was after, like, a stretch in the third where, like, He had multiple possessions where he just brought the ball up. Nobody else touched the rock. And he would just, you know, has he, has he tween, has he tween, get to his shot and brick, miss, you know, contested shot at the rim. And it was bad. It didn't look good. It didn't look like there was any flow to the offense. It looked like they just, they were just isolation heavy all through this game. And it didn't work. And then in the fourth, things started to open up a little bit more. Uh, KPJ in the fourth quarter was six of eight from the floor, didn't attempt a three, was three of three at the free throw line, 
had two board, sorry, had three boards, had one assist, just one turnover, 15 points, was a plus eight in the quarter for the Rockets. Jay Sean Tate, plus 11. And the Rockets kind of mounted a bit of a comeback. And they made it a game until the final moments where KPJ wound up having to sit down because he basically played the entirety of the fourth. And the Rockets made this like significant push, this run, and they wound up clawing to all the way within three. They got it down 92-89. And then the Jazz started, you know, kind of peeling away a little bit. The Rockets still kept it interesting. They kept it within three, kept it within a couple possessions, got it down 97-95. KPJ, you know, is, is, is leading the charge, right? Spearheading this comeback. And then eventually... KPJ goes and he has to he has to sit down for a little bit. So KPJ's on the bench and he's not even getting like he doesn't even get a full minute of rest. He gets like 57 seconds of rest on the Rockets bench. He comes back into the game and he winds up bumping knees late in the game and not even bumping knees. He took a he took a knee to the thigh late in the game. And he was hobbled. I mean, he was down on the floor in pain. The Utah Jazz like staff came over to take a look at him as soon as the dead ball was called and for whatever reason he wound up staying in the game now look I respect the heart and the fire and the 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 desire the competitive you know competitive side to want to stay in the game to finish this thing out but he was in no fit state to stay in the game he was visibly limping on the court so I admire the ability to change, you know, tap into another gear and spearhead this Rockets comeback. KPG had a good fourth quarter, right? He was he was being decisive with his reads. He was getting downhill. He was moving the basketball to teammates. It, it, things things were happening in the fourth quarter. And if KPJ had played like that for the entirety of the game, or even just even just one more quarter of the game. If he had played like that to start the game in the first or at some point in the second or the third, we might be talking about a Rockets win right now instead of a Rockets L. But it didn't, right? He had just the strong fourth quarter after a really bad, inconsistent, you know, not even inconsistent, just a bad three quarters. And the Rockets were this close to mounting the comeback. They ultimately couldn't kick down the door to win the game against the Jazz. But to me, the fact that KPJ stayed in the game was completely unacceptable. Like... He is visibly limping out there. And I don't know if it's a situation where maybe it's like, all right, well, he's going to, if he sits on the bench, it's going to like tense up and make it even worse. I, I saw that argument lobbed around a little bit by some Rockets. And it's like, well, then have him go like sit on the bike on the sideline, right? And, you know, have him go walk on a treadmill in the back if you're worried about the injury tensing up. Having him play in the game when he is A, a clear liability on the court and, and B, not playing to his full strength because if you're if you're that hobbled with a deep thigh bruise, you know, taking, taking a knee to the quad the way that he did, you're not going to be effective in the game. So this was like a really confusing game on all fronts because again, it was ugly through three quarters. It was even, it was still pretty ugly in the fourth. Rockets fought their way back. They almost made, they basically, they made it a game. They almost, you know, climbed over the hill. Couldn't quite get there. KPJ gets injured. No update on how bad the injury is, but he was visibly limping on the court. He should have been taken out of the game. I don't know if that was KPJ saying, I want to stay in the game, or if it was Steven Silas saying he can stay in the game, or if it was the medical staff who cleared him to stay in the game, but he was visibly hurt and still in the game in a meaningless game in October, game five of the season, it makes no sense. Make it make sense for me. So I did like what we saw out of KPJ in the fourth. Again, more decisive with his reads, getting downhill, looked like he was, again, kind of like, like he was in sixth gear, right? Like he like he he tapped into another level of play that wasn't there through the first three quarters. That's a good sign. That's a silver lining from this Rockets game. And there were a couple other silver linings. The Rockets half-court defense, Jalen Green's individual man-to-man defense. We'll talk about those coming up, as well as just what is wrong with the Houston Rockets offense. We're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Prize Picks. Tonight, I'm going to take Luka Doncic to score more than 26.5 points. How about LeBron James to have more than 7.5 rebounds? Kevin Durant, we'll take the under on 4.5 assists. And how about Steph Curry? We'll take more than 3.5 
threes. Look, what is prize picks? How does it work? It's so simple. You pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize pick projections, you can win up to 10 times back on your money on any entry that you submit. No competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. That's NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, you name it. They've got you covered over at prize picks. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. So go download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you dep- if you deposit 100 bucks, PrizePix will give you 100 bucks. If you deposit 50 bucks, PrizePix will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Let's run over a little bit some of the uh, let's let's take a look at some of the team stats from this game because the Rockets, what what really killed them. And again, the, the fourth quarter, they did clean things up, right? They had 17 turnovers through the first three quarters. They only had two in the fourth quarter. They, they really you know, they, they started taking better care of the basketball. And again, a lot of that points back towards Kevin Porter Jr., who was doing a much, much better job within the confines of the Rockets offense, actually getting things done. So uh, the turnovers absolutely killed the Rockets. They had 19 turnovers on the game to the tune of 20 Jazz points. The Jazz had 16 turnovers to the tune of 14 Rockets points. Fast break points absolutely destroyed the Rockets, though. Rockets had eight fast break points. To the Jazz's 25, the Jazz were plus 17 in transition. That's the game right there, guys. The Jazz were just feasting in transition because the Rockets were not getting back. In fact, I pulled a clip of one of the worst displays of transition defense, and it wasn't just Eric Gordon at fault. Two to three of the Rockets didn't even make it to the half-court line before the Jazz got a shot up. But... Jazz were running and gunning in transition. They kick ahead the pass. Rockets are, you know, lollygagging, jogging back. And I believe it was Clarkson. I could be wrong. I think it was Clarkson who caught the ball in the corner. And EG, who is playing, you know, three on two fast break defense, jogs out to, and jog is being generous, jogs out to the corner to contest the shot, barely gets an arm up, just kind of, you know, uh, it's going in. Like that was... I, I was I was speechless in the moment. I was like, what? I was like, what is EG even doing out there? Like he, that mentally checked out. Like the 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 defense not there. Like like not trying defensively, going through the motions. In the fourth quarter, when things actually started to like, you know, heat up a little bit and when the game got close, EG actually kind of locked back in a little bit mentally. EG actually kind of locked back in and, and was, you know, was making an impact on the game. But it was like at at that point, it's like, what are we doing, man? Like, if you can do this throughout the game, why not actually, you know, do it? There was a possession where, you know, Jazz player drove in, EG was checking him, you know, forced him to the baseline and did his, you know, his typical, like, EG, like, bodied up to him, you know, hands at his sides, not fouling, forced him to the baseline. Jabari came over as the help side defender, forced the out-of-bounds call. Like, it was, it was, fan, it was a fantastic defensive possession. Give me that throughout the game, not just in the fourth quarter after mounting a miraculous comeback thanks to Kevin Porter Jr., so it was ridiculous. It was, it was a bad overall game. Rockets for the night shot 38.3% from the floor, just 20, 27.5% from long range. They managed to shoot 75% at the charity stripe uh, at 49 rebounds. They had 19 assists on their 36 made shots. Again, a heavy amount of isolation. Uh, they were competitive, though, with the Jazz on the boards. They were only minus four in the rebounding department. Jazz finished with 53 rebounds. Look, the Jazz also shot poorly from three. It was kind of like last game where the, I mean, the Rockets won the game at the free throw line because they mirrored the Jazz so closely in so many of the other statistical categories. The Rockets were the better free throw shooting team, although the Jazz had two more makes at the charity stripe, but they only shot 66, 66.7%. Uh, jazz shot slightly better from the floor. Like overall, these two teams were like right there because of how well the Rockets actually started to play in the fourth quarter, courtesy of Kevin Porter Jr. But elsewhere throughout the game, I mean, Jalen Green was 6 of 20, just 2 of 9 from three-point range, got to the free throw line a handful of times. Jalen Green did have seven rebounds in this one, so I did like how aggressively he was rebounding the basketball. Two assists, one steal, one block, two turnovers. You know, okay night. EG, you know, 
going through the motions. He had a couple, he had a couple threes that were kind of big, but just two of seven, three point shooting had a couple of his, you know, usual EG drives in the paint. Jay Sean Tate in his uh, Rockets season debut uh, entered the starting lineup, had seven points on three of five shooting, nailed his only three pointer, but it's because the jazz defense just left him wide open because uh, they didn't honor him as a shooter. It was Kelly Olenek who was, you know, guarding him and Kelly was just like, eh, let, let, let Tate shoot it. Five rebounds, one assist. Impact, you know, so-so throughout the game. I uh, had one play where he just, like, drove into the lane and, like, spun, like, six times in a row and committed a turnover early in the game. It was you know, maybe knocking the rust off a little bit. Jabari, just 10 points on three of 10 shooting. Did have nine rebounds, so you like to see, again, the Rockets being aggressive on the glass. Da- elsewhere, you know, throughout the lineup, Tari, six boards off the bench. KJ, 10 boards off the bench. Garuba, five boards. So at least the rebounding is there, right? They're, they're fighting hard, and the Rockets did fight really hard to get back into this game. But offensively, this team just looks, they look like a train wreck. It Here's the thing, right? Offensively, this Rockets team still doesn't have an identity. They don't. It, it, all it is, is it seems like every game, possessions devolve into isolation. And they run, you know, their, their base offense is isolations and pick and roll. And the problem is they don't have any other actual pick and roll threats right now. They don't have LP. They don't have Bruno. So those are their two actual like five, you know, center pick and roll threats. Jabari is running your five spot and he is a pick and pop threat, but they're not utilizing him very much as a pick and pop threat. And Jabari is not a roll threat currently, or at least they're not utilizing him as a roll threat. We've seen him roll a couple times and it's looked okay, but they're not doing it at all. They're not even testing it out. Uh, So a lot of the Rockets offense just boils down to they set a quick screen or they get, you know, Jalen or somebody coming off a curl on the weak side. They kick him the ball and he catches the ball, you know, so-and-so, whoever, EG, Jalen, KPJ, they catch the ball and they're 25 feet away from the rim. And then it's, all right, let me dance on you for a minute and try and get a bucket, right? Try to break you down off the dribble and driving in and it's drive and kick offense. And that like, it works sometimes but it doesn't work a lot of the time. It's, you know, driving kick and the driving kick was kind of working there in the fourth quarter where the jazz were, you know, in rotation and they, they, you know, they were stumbling on defense and it looked all right for, for stretches, but it's not a reliable, it, 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 everything, again, I said it early on, it feels like the Rockets just work incredibly hard to get their shots, right? It feels like, it feels like offense does not come easy to this Houston Rockets team. And I don't know why that is. They've got a ton of talented players and a lot of their offense sometimes just boils down to KPJ is just crazy talented and he's just going to get you a bucket, you know, scoring over two outstretched arms, you know, two sets of outstretched arms on defense because he missed the read where there was a wide open guy in the corner or on the wing. And there were, there were a ton of moments like that throughout this game where like Jalen brought the, you know, caught the ball and brought it up in transition and he had EG wide open in the corner and instead he resets it out to the top of the key to KPJ or the four on five possession where Jalen had the ball and didn't recognize that they, the Rockets had a five on four and took too long to set it up and tried to whip the pass across the court to KPJ. And by then the fifth jazz player was back in the picture. Uh, There was just a lot of mess throughout this game, a lot of discombobulation on offense and it's, it's got to stem from Steven Silas. Like, I, I don't know why we can't see, Right. I don't know why we can't see some of the actions that like, I don't know, Garrison Matthews gets run for him, right? Where he comes curling off a screen and he catches and shoots or he runs like across two screens across the court and he loses a defender and catch and shoot from the wing. Like, why can't we see some of that action for Jabari Smith Jr.? Right. Like that'd be like Jabari can shoot and Jabari can come running off screens or, you know, get Jabari at the elbow where we know he likes to be able to have like his triple threat and he can attack or he can elevate. Like we haven't seen any of that. It feels like there's just a, a distinct lack of creativity in this Rockets offense, and it, it does not make for an enjoyable basketball product to watch at times because it just, again, it boils down to a lot of, all right, KPJ's got the rock, he's going to bail you out with talent, or EG's got the rock, he's going to bail you out by driving to, the bu- driving to the hole and just bouncing defenders off of him, or Jalen Green's going to bail you out because he's just Jalen Green and he's just insanely talented. And that's basically it. And the Jazz adjusted, right? The, the Rockets went ISO heavy in the first game against the Jazz. Steven Silas mentioned post game that he told the players that they weren't going to be able to do that again. 
And lo and behold, they did it again. And the Jazz took it a bit more personally this time. And defensively, they stepped it up. They did things like the moment Jabari Smith Jr. touched the ball or put the ball on the floor, they pressured the hell out of Jabari Smith Jr. because they know he's not a, a comfortable, like, live dribble type of guy on the floor, right? The moment Jabari put the ball on the floor, the Jazz were pressuring him, and it, it resulted in a couple turnovers. It resulted in, you know, some, some, you know, bad passes, some, you know, stagnant offense because Jabari was uncomfortable the moment he put the ball on the floor. Rockets offense is... It... it it's not exclusively because they're missing players, although that doesn't help matters, and, and things will probably look a little bit better once they get, you know, Bruno back and Al P back. You know, th those guys will will definitely help things. But I think there's just something inherently kind of wrong with what the Rockets are trying to do offensively because it, it just keeps boiling down to isolation play, which is not great basketball to watch. Coming up, I do want to hit on some of the other silver linings from this game as well as some of the other rotation issues in this one, we're going to talk about that in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, as far as the Houston Rockets game is concerned, there was, you know, maybe a couple other silver linings here and there. Garuba, in his eight minutes of play, was hustling, you know, got got his rebounds, had a couple turnovers, uh, you know, didn't really, they didn't really utilize Garuba in the pick and roll at all. Like, there's not really any opportunities for Garuba to, you know, showcase his passing ability out of the middle of the floor to, you know, try and collapse the Jazz defense. K.J. Martin off the bench was, you know, uh, impressive on the boards, did have three assists, uh, just three of nine shooting, though, uh, got to the free throw line a handful of times. So KJ, you know, decent game off the Rockets bench. Gary Bird, probably one of the only other silver linings from this game, and that's depending on how you look at silver linings. Uh, 11 points, three of five shooting, uh, hit, you know, again, all, all of his shots were threes. And then he had one play near the end of the game where he, like, drove the ball in and threw his body into the Jazz defender and got to the free throw line because... Gary Bird doesn't have like a, you know, a layup package when there's like defenders in front of him. So he just he got to the free throw line and it worked. Um, so and and Gary Bird also had a really I mean, Gary Bird had a, a really nice dime to KPJ during the comeback where they were in transition two on one and Gary Bird had the rock and he was dribbling, went straight up to the defender and then did a wraparound pass to KPJ and KPJ was able to get up for the easy two. So, I mean, Gary Bird, this was easily his best game of the season it doesn't necessarily warrant more minutes because, you know, maybe he's finally out of his shooting slump. I don't know. I, I didn't like the fact that Gary Bird got so much fourth quarter run. The rotations in the fourth quarter felt like they were all over the place. Silas rode KPJ during the entire fourth quarter and then decided to rest him and, and you know, have him sitting out for like, the again, the 60 seconds, 57 seconds, whatever it was near the end of the game. And at that point, I'm thinking like, just keep him in the game. I mean, you know, let him, you know, ride the hot hand. He might be a little gassed, sure, but he's making good decisions on the floor. Just keep him in or just call the timeout so that he can get a quick 60-second breather, but don't actually check him out of the game. And, yeah, I, I, it felt very reminiscent of the first Jazz game where, like, he got into the fourth quarter and it was, like, these very, like, quick rapid-fire substitutions of, okay, well, I need to get this guy a breather and this guy needs a breather and this guy needs a breather. And I don't know. It was... It was all over the place, the substitution patterns. Boban Marjanovic getting two minutes again early in this game in the first quarter to match up with Walker Kessler is kind of a big question mark. Like, I get Kessler's a big body, but, you know, if you're just going to throw Boban in there for two minutes and if he's not actually going to mirror all of Walker Kessler's minutes, then, like, what's the point in throwing Boban in there? And let's just, you know, hey, here's a couple minutes to appease the veteran, which he finished the game with a flat zero stat line. Two minutes played, zeros across the board for Boban Marjanovic. Dacian Nix had a bad game. Like, after having a, you know, his best game of the season, best game of the season against the Jazz last game, really bad game for Dacian. Zero points, 0 of 3 from the floor, 0 of 2 from 3. He, he had a handful of assists, but they weren't, like, they weren't, like, high-quality assists. Some of them were just, all right, here's the one pass, and, like, a player elevates and shoots, and it's, like, bad shot, but went in. Uh, he had four turnovers, and some of them were, were some bad, you know, some bad turnovers. Smoked a layup at the at the rim, I believe. Uh, just not a great not a great game from, from Dacian Nix. And then uh, DNP coach's decision, Josh Christopher. 
I mean, that could be a little telling, right? He got four minutes last game, I believe. Didn't play this game. And and Josh is kind of a guy, right, when the Rockets are struggling the way that they were offensively. Like, Josh can be that kind of, like, spark off the bench, right, where if he gets it going one night, like, you put him in and he's, like, boom, 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 gets to his midi, gets to his driving spots, like, finishing at the rim. He can be an instant, like, you know, 5, 10, 15 points off the bench on any given night. But to not even go to him, I think, speaks volumes about kind of where he stands in the Rockets rotation, in the pecking order, with, you know, other guys in the lineup. I mean, obviously, you're still missing Alpi and Bruno. Those are two rotation guys. And once those two guys are back, like, I don't think we're going to see Garuba much. I don't think we're going to see any Boban. And I think Knicks and Matthews are going to have their minutes cut into heavily as well. One, if not both of those guys, may just be out of the rotation once Alpi and Bruno are back. And Shingun is supposed to join the Rockets at some point on this road trip. Uh, It's TBD when he does join them, but they need him back in the worst way. Because at least with Bruno and Al P out there, you have different variations to what the Rockets offense can do. Because right now, they're not, it's all just isolation. when, When you have Bruno out there, you have a good screener, somebody who can roll and who can, you know, attack the glass and who's also able to play above the rim offensively. That gives you another dimension. When you have Al P out there, you have a completely different dimension. You have a big who can do so many different things on the floor that it actually changes up your offense completely to where you can play out of the low post, you can play out of the high post, you can run dribble handoff sets on the perimeter, and Al is a good enough passer and scorer by himself that he can kind of shoulder some of the offensive load throughout portions of the game, which is why, again, I still think him coming off the bench is the right move. But missing both of those guys, and then the offense just turns into... Blah, what we saw. Man, I'm really, I, I'm glad I kind of like waited to record this because if I had recorded this immediately after the game, I would have been even more heated. Like I'm still pretty heated about what we saw because it was just, it was frustrating basketball and that's putting it lightly. So the other silver lining from this game that I haven't spent enough time on is Jalen Green. And I probably, maybe I shouldn't have tucked it all the way here at the end, but you know, what are you going to do? Jalen Green's defense, his man-to-man defense, has been pretty fantastic this season. He has ba- he's really like taken it kind of personally to really check up on uh, you know on guys like you know throughout these first five games when he has a defensive task, he rises to the occasion. And he's had some really good defensive stops through these first five games. He's made his presence felt defensively. I think the added muscle is is helping him defensively at times, kind of absorbing contact and not just getting bounced around the way that he was last season at points. And he's just being a smarter defender, right? When you you see him like squeezing and hugging on pick and rolls, you see him fighting hard over screens, all of that. So Jalen Green's on-ball defense, when he is you know actively checking somebody, has been really solid. And it was solid in this game against the Jazz. And it was solid last game against the Jazz. However, his transition defense and his defensive awareness when his assignment doesn't actually have the ball is still pretty bad. He's getting, you know, the, the jazz are cutting back door on him at time. You know, they, they, they cut back door. He's you know unaware of some of that stuff. The rotations that he makes are all over the place. Sometimes like the Rockets had a possession where two people closed out. And I believe Jalen was one of them. Two guys closed out on Jared Vanderbilt in the corner and it led to a wide open Jordan Clarkson three. So, you know, the, some of the understandings, the principles of what to do defensively, how to rotate, where to be, that stuff is still not sticking or it's not, you know, sticking collectively as a team. So that is kind of frustrating to see. But on an individual basis, one-on-one, Jalen's defense has actually been pretty solid. And I, I mentioned, you know, the Jazz cutting some of the stuff that... The Jazz, watching the Jazz play offense and then watching the Rockets play offense was just night and day, right? Like, they had moments where they would have, you know, somebody in the post and then have somebody, like, cut through the lane and throw a pass over the top and you get an easy layup at the rim. You have drive and kick game happening, gets the defense in rotation. Like, the problem is isolation isn't inherently bad, right? We've seen isolation-heavy offenses do incredibly well in the NBA. Isolation is good. When you've got talented players who can isolate, you want to exploit that. You can't only do that on offense. You have to mix in other things to keep the defense honest. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're just going to have defense loading up on the one guy who's driving in. And if the one guy who's driving in isn't actively looking for who the defense is sagging off of, then 
it, you're basically playing one on two every single time because you're going to drive in. There's going to be a help defender to come over and try to cut off the driving lane. And you're shooting over two pairs of outstretched arms. My last point here in this game about the rotations is at one point Jalen Green was out there. So KPJ and Jalen not staggered in the first half, staggered in the second half. Didn't really help Jalen, you know, struggled no matter what. KPJ, he took off in the fourth quarter. Uh, but it, it's not like Jalen had a lineup on the floor that was really going to help him because Jalen was out there at one point, I believe, with Garuba, KJ, Tari, and Dacian Nix, I think was the lineup. So he was quite literally out there with four non-shooters. So it was Jalen Green and four non-shooters surrounding him. And I get like, you know, roster crunch, you're missing key guys, rotations are going to be a little all over the place. But like, Give Jalen some kind of help, man. No driving lanes, no nothing, no floor spacing. Like, it was just, it was not pretty. Um, I feel like I have a lot of gripes about this game and not a lot of questions answered about this one other than if KPJ could play like he did in the fourth quarter throughout all four quarters, then feel fantastic about his game moving forward. But he only did it for one quarter. Rockets fell a little bit short. And they've got to deal with the Portland Trailblazers Friday night. So our next episode, we're going to kind of dive in deeper detail about the Rockets offense, some of the problems that they are being uh, plagued with offensively currently with Ali Khan Bajani, our weekly co-host. Uh, so don't want to miss out on that episode. I do believe if Ali Khan is ready, drum roll, maybe, uh, I think we're going to be unveiling our new little telestration tool. So that should be a lot of fun. We might have it out this week. It might be next week. I don't know. Um, but with that, that's going to do it for today's episode. As always, appreciate you for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. 